Well, as the children get situated back into their seats with all their candy, I would like for you to turn your attention to our gospel passage today. Yes, today we are observing Epiphany. Epiphany, as you can tell, we are still having our Christmas decorations still up. Thank you, sir. And, um, and, uh, but yes, this is the time of Epiphany. So today we are going to be reading from Matthew's gospel, the second chapter, verses 1 through 12. So I invite you to stand as you are able and body or spirit in honor of the reading of the gospel passage. In the time of King Herod, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, asking, Where is the child who has been born king of the Jews? For we observed his star at its rising and have come to pay him homage. When King Herod heard this, he was frightened, and all of Jerusalem with him, and calling together all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born. And they told him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for it is written by the prophet, And you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who is the shepherd of my people. Then Herod secretly called for the wise men and learned from them the exact time when the star had appeared. Then he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child. And when you have found him, bring me words that I may go and pay him homage. And when they heard the king, they set out, and there ahead of them went the star that they had seen at his rising, until it stopped over the place where the child was. And when they saw that the star had stopped, they were overwhelmed with joy. On entering the house, they saw the child with Mary his mother. They knelt down and paid him homage. Then opening their treasure chest, they offered him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they left on their own country by another road. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. You know, when Sam told me this morning, or I saw actually this morning when we were getting here, getting everything set up, he had this book sitting out on the, on the table back there. I said, Sam, where did you get this? And he said, well, I brought it. I'm going to use it in children's moment. And I was like... You and I are just kindred spirits, because I was definitely going to talk about the magic eye, okay? Magic eye. My experience with this book goes way back to when I was in middle school, and if any of you had the benefit of growing up in the 70s, 80s, 90s, early 2000s, more than likely when you were a teenager or whatever, you got dropped off, probably at a mall at one point where you can roam around with your friends and hang out for a little while without your parents, or they may be in the department stores while you go to the food court. Well, for me, growing up in the late 90s and early 2000s, my experience with my friends was getting dropped off at North Park Mall. Okay, that was the only mall in the Tri-County area that you can be dropped off at, and go and just have free reign. And so our friends would run around to the food courts and get those pretzels that smelled so good, and then we'd run into all these stores not buying anything, but just to go and look around. I think it was Brooks Brothers that had all the chairs that would massage your necks and all that kind of stuff you hang out in. Well, there was always a cart in the mall next to the little cell phone cart where you could spend all your high school paycheck on those little phone cases that would break in two weeks. you just buy them and buy them and buy them. There was a cart for the Magic Eye where they had the books and the posters, all kinds of things you can buy. And whenever I was with my older sister, she'd pick it up right off the bat. Horse. I'm like, horse? How do you see that? I'm sitting here just staring at it, and I'm walking away into people. I was like, I don't see the horse. And whenever I went with my friends, they'd be like, oh, that's a castle. How do you see the castle? It's the most frustrating thing ever. The mall was a wonderful experience for me, except for the cart that ruined it called the Magic Eye Cart. I did not like the Magic Eye Cart. So when I saw that this morning, I was like, Sam... Where'd you get this? I still can't see it. I, I really still can't see it. Um, but to have that, you do have to get yourself out of focus so then you can focus in on what the true meaning is in within that picture. And I think today's story of Epiphany from Matthew really highlights one thing that we all need to think about is focus. You know, as we're coming into the new year, what is our focus this year? Not what is your, your personal goals of, you know, of losing weight or going to knock off some destinations on your bucket list. No, but what is your spiritual focus for this year? What is going to be the thing that you put all your energy and effort into 
in trying to see and figure out and see how it moves in your own life. And I think today's story is just perfect for that. Because this is the moment where we see wise men from the East. They are curious Gentiles at best. But they were at least focused into something that drew them to Jerusalem. Drew them to see the king of the Jews. And I think there's a lot that we can learn from these wise men. And also learn from Herod, the chief priests and the scribes as well. You see, in this day and age, when you get to this point, you, you, you have the Roman government controlling the land... And the way that Rome ruled is that they would install puppet rulers and kings of these areas that they can easily control. And so when Rome conquered this area that Jerusalem rests in and that Bethlehem and all the Holy Land rest in, when they, when they conquered that, they established a quote-unquote puppet king of the Jews. That's King Herod. And they said, you guess what, King Herod? You can just rule the land as you'd like as long as there's no trouble. As long as our troops can move freely through your territory, as long as our government officials can have their headquarters here, as long as you pay your taxes and there's no rebellion, you can, que- you can keep the title of King of the Jews. Okay? And so that is Herod. He likes his title. He likes his power and authority and his coziness to Rome. His focus was not on looking for the Messiah. His focus was on himself. And so when it says here in the time of King Herod, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, wise men from the east came asking, Where is the child who has been born king of the, church, the Jews? For we observe the star is rising. We come to pay him homage. That's going to get Herod's attention, right? He's king of the Jews. What, what is this child that these people from the east are coming to pay homage to? It was very common from folks from the east to travel through to Roman territory and pay homage to the rulers of the Roman territory. King Herod would have thought they were coming to see him. And it's quite the entourage. It's not the three lowly figures that you see at your nativity scenes. No. They would have had a whole group of individuals following them. Riding on animals. It would have been a big old caravan of people coming to see the ruler of the land, the king of the land. And for Herod, it would have thought it had been me, king of the Jews, right? But no, it wasn't him. It was a child, as they proclaimed. And these wise men, a lot of times you hear they're called kings. That tradition really got developed in the medieval ages where they decided to add more pomp and circumstance to these wise men from the east. In all actuality, they were astronomers from the east from the areas of Persia. And they would observe the night sky. And they would note the course of the stars. They would make predictions on the forecast for weathers and things of that nature. They were wise men that the rulers of Persia in that area would seek advice from to help them make decisions. And so these astronomers, these magi, these wise men would just stare at the stars. I don't know if any of y'all have the hobby of looking at the stars. But when you do, if you do it over the course of the year, and you look up on clear nights, there's predictable patterns the stars are. And you can make notes and things on where they're positioned and when they'll come back and how things change. And so these people would do this for their livelihood as part of their everyday lives. They would watch the stars and make notes. And so when you see something different that pops up, You take note of that as well. And you begin to analyze and question why is that there? Is that a comet that's coming through? Fallen star, what is that? In our day and age, is that an airplane flying through? You know, we don't know. But you look at it. And these people would have noticed something was different. They're focusing on the skies and they see this magnificent star. For it says in in the book of Numbers in the Old Testament... Chapter 24, verse 17, it says, A star shall come out of Jacob, a scepter shall rise out of Israel. It was written even before Jesus was born that there was a star that would rise out of Israel. The interesting thing about these astronomers 
these magi, these wise men from the area of what would be Persia. The Hebrew people were in exile in the past in that land. They were conquered before and were forced to move to this region of the earth. And over the course of years, they would be allowed to migrate back to Israel and to Jerusalem to rebuild. That's a story in the Old Testament. But not every one of them left. Some stayed behind. And so did the stories of Yahweh and his people. And so these wise men would have heard the stories and would have known enough that this star rising out of the house of Israel means something. It means that the king of the Jews has been born. Let's go follow it. And so they did. You see, they had the right focus. They were looking at the stars. They knew enough the story. They went to Jerusalem and they were going to ask, where is the new king of the Jews? They had the right focus. But it says here, when King Herod heard this, he was frightened all of Jerusalem with him, and calling together all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them, where is the Messiah to be born? And they told him, in Bethlehem of Judea, for it is so written by the prophet, and you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means the least among the rulers of Judah, for of you shall come a ruler who is my shepherd to the people. And so when King Herod heard this, When he heard this, he thought, you know what? This is a threat to my authority. I need to get rid of this king. I need to get rid of this child. And I need to do it now. He was a bad dude. Herod would have killed his first wife. Would have killed some of his sons due to paranoia. To the threat of his rule. Even Caesar, the ruler of the Roman Empire, said it's better to be one of Herod's pigs than one of his own sons. He was a bad dude. And the people of Jerusalem in that area, they would tolerate Herod and his ruthless acts because he was a good administrator. He got things done. He built great bridges and and great roads and kept Rome happy, kept the peace. It's kind of amazing of what humankind can tolerate and what evils we can tolerate as long as there's quote-unquote peace for us at the moment, right? We're not the ones being killed by the ruler. It's all right for us, so we'll tolerate him. That's Herod. They tolerated this ruler, even though he's a bad guy, because, eh, for me, things seem to be going okay. There's no potholes in the road. He's not going after my family. It seems all right. But people became frightened too. When it says that Jerusalem was frightened with him, those that were aware that King Herod knew there was a king of the Jews and he wanted to go pay the new king homage, they were frightened. They didn't know what he was going to do. They didn't know who he was going to go after to find this threat to his rule. So they became frightened. But yet, The Magi, the wise men, they didn't know this. If they would have known this, they probably would not have gone to King Herod. But they did, and it alerted him. And so the people of the day missed it. They missed the coming of the Messiah. You would have thought the religious leaders, the chief priests and the scribes, if they would have noticed this star, if they would have noticed there was this thing that was different, they would have noticed that this Messiah would have been born. They would have been excited Right? They would have been ready to meet the Savior because in their minds the Messiah was going to kick out Rome. They thought the Messiah was going to be another King David and establish their kingdom again, their united kingdom of Israel. And things are going to be great again. And so you would have thought the chief priests who were the religious leaders and the scribes that knew all of this would have been looking. But they weren't. They were focused on telling Herod what he wanted to hear. They were focused on keeping their people calm so they wouldn't aggravate Rome and bring Rome back down on them. They lost their focus. 
and they missed it. And that is what is ironic, is that these Gentiles who weren't necessarily followers of God, but just knew about God, but knew the importance of this moment, they came for the journey to come pay homage. And so when Herod secretly called for the wise man and learned from the exact time when the star had appeared, he sent them to Bethlehem saying, Go and search diligently for the child. When you have found him, bring me words that I may also go and pay him homage. And so when they heard the king, they set out ahead of, and ahead of them and went to the star that they had seen its rising. And the star stopped at the place where the child was born, and they were overwhelmed with joy. And on entering the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they knelt down and paid him homage, opening their treasure chest, offering him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. I mean, can you imagine what Mary's reaction would have been when she opened the door and saw these magi, these wise men from the east, there with treasure chest and all of their entourage of people and animals to come pay her child homage. Now she knew who Jesus would become because she was told. She knew, but she didn't expect already that he would be worshipped and honored at such a young age. And the gifts they brought aren't the typical gifts that we all now see when you have your typical baby showers. They didn't bring diapers and formula and bottles and all kinds of things and all these things to wrap them up in. No. They brought three gifts, or we are told of these three gifts. And like everything in Scripture, there is a meaning behind it. It wasn't just random gold, random frankincense, and random myrrh. There was a purpose to it. You see, gold was given for them because they would need it. Mary and Joseph would need gold. Frankincense was used in religious practices. It was something of the divine, acknowledging the divinity of Christ, of Jesus, of that child. And you give them frankincense. And then an odd gift, though, would have been myrrh, which is used a lot for burial. Now, for us who know the end of the story, understand why myrrh was given in that moment. But at that time, it might have seemed a little odd to be given myrrh to a child. But these were gifts that were given for a purpose and at the right moment. Because the last verse in this passage says, And having been warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they left their own country by another road. And it ends there. Now for us that are familiar with the story, we know that King Herod goes after to find this child king of the Jews and to eliminate the threat to his rule. Herod sends out a decree for all male children aged two and younger to be murdered. And that is what happened. Because that is the age he predicts that the Christ child would have been based off what the Magi have told him. And we know that being visited in a dream that Mary and Joseph would leave Bethlehem and would flee to Egypt and become refugees in a foreign land in an attempt to save their child. That's where gold would have come in handy for their journey. That is where that would have helped. The right gift, the right moment. It wasn't for Jesus' trust fund. It was so they can pay for their route to Egypt. And you see, God, is, He works like that in lives. Whether our focus and we realize it or not, many a times He gives you exactly just enough sometimes to get by at the right moment, at the right time. Jesus came into this world with the threat Of someone coming to kill him. With the political authorities and religious authorities out to get him at a young age. He escaped. But eventually at the end of his life it would catch up to him. Because the threat of killing was there again at the end. As he went to the cross. He didn't have always an easy life. But yet... 
in this story that you see. You see here in Bethlehem, in a common place with common people, the Christ child, and the gift and the hope of promise of what that means for us. And then you see the parallel of Herod and his palace with the chief priests and the scribes with the threat of terror and destruction. You see the contrast that we all have in our world today of hope and destruction. But God's gift is a gift given to us exactly at the right moment in the time in which we need it, amongst the threats in our own lives. And God did not choose to send Jesus into the world as a king in a palace with all the comforts of life, but no, he chose a young girl to bear the child. People of not status to be the parents of Christ. And so what that tells us today is where is our focus? Where do we see God in our world today? Will we see God in the power structures in our own lives? Will we see God in the, the wealth and the political powers? Or will we see God more in the marginalized, see God in the poor, see God in those that are broken? Because in this story, God chose to go to the poor, to the broken, to the marginalized. And I think if we're not careful, we can lose our focus. We can lose where we are putting all of our energies into. Are we putting our energies into pleasing those that are above us? Those that can benefit us? Or are we putting our energy and focus into those that God is calling us to serve? Those that society doesn't quite want to love. I think we see in this story where our focus should be. I think we see in this story how we can be that star for someone in their lives. And so that's why I love Epiphany. Epiphany is often overlooked in many circles, but I think it's one of the most important holy holidays that we can observe because there we can see the true meaning of what Christmas is, the gift of hope through Christ that God gives us. It is the way we are to focus our lives on those who we serve and love. Epiphany means is that divine moment is when those divine moments with God comes in place with humankind. That's epiphany. It's where the divine interjects itself into human history. And here you have that epiphany. So what is your epiphany? Where is God interacting in your life? Where is God showing up and choosing or calling you to focus? I think that's an important question we need to ask ourselves. I think we need to ask ourselves that, and as a church, we need to ask ourselves, where are we focusing our gifts and talents and our energies this year? What are we missing? What are we missing? What are we wasting our energies on? And what do we need to redirect? I think in life we are too busy sometimes just to look up at the stars. The only chances that I get are the random times that I have to go outside and make sure that I put the trash cans out before the morning time because it ain't going to happen in the morning. I'm always rushing home at lunch hoping I'd, the trash guy hadn't come by yet if I don't do it. Or it's when it's Christmas time and I'm out there unplugging the Christmas lights. But it's not on the regular. I'm not always looking up at the stars, but when I do, I am amazed at what I see. At the artwork of our Creator and all that we have yet to even seen. And I think if we look at our own personal lives or day to day, I think there's things like that that we're missing. And so may the gifts of the Magi, may the gift of the Christ child, may the epiphanies in our own lives help us to focus on what truly matters and what God is calling us to do this year.
Let us pray.